Thing is hexy. Let's talk about game number two. Long Street Attacks. All right. Um, Revolution Games. So this is the second of the Herman Lutman games that I just got through playing Stonewall Sword. Now we're playing Long Street Attacks. And just go ahead and say this right off the bat. Freaking gorgeous game. Beautiful Rick Barber map. Excellent counters. Um, like I say, I think when I did my intro to this, I had to turn myself sideways because the setup threw me off a little bit because I'm so used to looking at other games in Gettysburg where, uh, where McClaws and Hood are in a straight line, but they're in a straight line like this on the map, okay? And this map's a little camera, which is cool because now it covers more ground. So this incorporates the second day at Gettysburg uh, down near the round tops, Long Street's attack with McClaw, with Hood and McClaws, and then Anderson's um, coming in as the third wave. And I'm going to say something here for those of you if, if you've never read about it. You know, everybody knows about Hoods and McClaws and how that went, how they started their attacks in echelon. Things never really got organized properly, but it was, it was, you know, as was it Long Street said about the fighting on that deck, I can't remember what the statement was, but how it was probably the best fighting done by any men ever in the history of warfare. Um, but I'm going to tell you, if you want to get into something, do some research on the attacks from Anderson's division, because it gets overlooked. And if you get in, I don't remember which one it was, whether it was Wilcox or whether it was Wright or Posey, I can't remember. I, th I don't want to say it was Wright or Wilcox, I can't remember. But they actually penetrated the cemetery ridge line coming down to little round top, but they had like no support. So, um, the first thing that threw me off when I started, this was where the second core units set up. And again, that's because of the way I'm looking at the map. So, and I know that, that Hancock had to adjust second core to put troops over there to support sickles. Um, I just didn't realize they were this close. Cause I mean, you're, you're talking there's fifth core and second core elements all through right there. Now, the game does account for their their activation, and there's a bunch of union units that you know you don't just you don't just have all the stuff that gets activated right away like the Confederates. You know they start with Hood, and then an hour later McClaws can be activated, and then you know you've got your command chits like Longstreet, Sickles, and Hancock. Um, even the third corps, you, not everybody gets activated right off the bat. I think the second turn in, you get to drop one of the divisional chits in there. So I think I did Bernie. I did the most, the one that was getting hit first, I dropped him in there, and then on the next turn, you'll be able to drop the other one. And then over time, other stuff will start getting activated. Now, what's really cool is, is when you do, when you draw a divisional chit in this game, you got to roll against their command rating to see if the unit can do a full activation, if a brigade can do a full activation or a limited. So the 5th Corps had three brigades that were supposed to arrive on the second turn. And two of the three ended up with the limited activation and couldn't do nothing. Or they, yeah, I didn't roll for a good activation on their division commander so that they can come in. Now, I'm not sure. I don't remember reading in the rules where it says that reinforcements come on regardless of uh, an activation roll, but I, I don't remember reading that anywhere. So two of them didn't move on, one did. All right, so we've progressed through two turns in this game too. We've played the, uh, uh, the 4 p.m. and the 4.20 p.m. turn, 20-minute increments. And, of course, the... Hood's attack goes in first, and I really wanted to push that as far as I could towards the round tops. So in, what, 40 minutes of play? Um, granted, every time I... So the, the first unit that I was able to get out and move in was Law, and headed forward, closest to the enemy in the fight. And then when I drew the Long Street shit... Or you have a chit called Command Momentum. If you get the command, I think it's the command the command momentum chit, when you draw it, you can you can take the last unit you activated and you can activate them again immediately. And then you can get the long street chit, which you can use to activate a brigade, regardless of whether it's been activated. So you could almost get three activations from one brigade if you wanted to. So Law was the first one to get out with full activations, and I started pushing with him. And then I had Robertson, Robertson, and Anderson, which Anderson, I ended up doing one of the extended, or the, uh, they have a move event chit. I'm sorry, I put it back in the cup. I can't think of it off the top of my head. But it's a, a quick march or something like that where they can double up, double their movement. So he was able to get all the way to the front. And now Benning's following up. 
um, back over here, McClaws, he hasn't been activated yet. And another 20 minutes from now, all of McClaws stuff will get into the fight. And then I believe an hour beyond that, Anderson stuff sitting way up in here, he'll get activated. So, and potentially what could happen is, is that the union will have to start shifting troops from the big cluster they got over in here to sort of help this fight, which you can see we're already doing, already moving union troops in here down behind the round tops. And that was just, you know, you, it's one of those things where you got a Hancock command shit and you're like, okay, well, who do I move? And I moved Harrow over, and then I, the second turn, I drew Hancock again. I'm like, well, do I want to go get another brigade? I said, no, let's move Harrow a little farther. Let's get him in the gap be between the two round tops. And then the 5th Corps guys came on on the second turn, and only one of those brigades was able to move. So I brought Weed in and headed him straight this way. So in sense, in, as you can see, the Confederates have already taken a little round top. All right, they got beat up a little bit, but they've already taken a little round top. They've got a flipped unit. They've got a disorganized, a disrupted unit. They've got a shaking unit. But they took it to the Union, who they have put one of the Union regiments in the broken free box, and they've eliminated an artillery. Uh, you have fragile units in this game, which I still haven't determined what that is yet. Um, and your artillery, when they get uh, uh, sent to the broken, they don't get broken, you, they're eliminated from the game. All right, but Law has driven up to the base of Big Round Top. He's driven into the uh, uh, val was it the Valley of Death, and they've taken Little Round Top. Okay, so those victory points at the end of the turn, there was one for each of those hexes right there. They got the Confederates already up three victory points. Okay, Benning hasn't even reached the fight yet, and Anderson hasn't even fought yet, and Robertson, one of his one of his regiments, has fought. But see, they're kind of scattered now. These guys are going to be out of support. So in the next phase, they gotta, they're going to have to tighten their line back up again. And I imagine the Confederates will take big round top. And th then they need to start directing their top on, on their attack on little round top. And then probably by that time, uh, McClaws should be into full force, which right now it appears that McClaws is actually going to end up sweeping in through here. The original plan was to tack up the Emmitsburg Road because uh, Lee saw where the Union forces had come out and their flank was sitting out here on Emmitsburg Road. So McClaws will probably drive in here all right, through the Trestle House, the Trestle Farm, all right, through the Peach Orchard, through the Trestle Farm, and then see if they can't break up some of this here, which will also cause the Union maybe not to focus so many units back towards the round tops in the fight because if they do that, they'll thin this line out and then the only thing, and then you'll have Anderson's division attacking eventually over here. So this, this I'll have to brainstorm this one. Okay, loving this. Uh, a few rules changes from the Stonewall Sword. Um, the event chits are different. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of different event chits in this one compared to Stonewall Sword. Um, activation. It, it, the process is the same. Pretty much, but there's some subtle rules changes in this. Uh, a lot of victory conditions that you can apply to it at the end of the game and during the turns. So, all right, so two turns down, fun. Hood's attack is off and running. They've already cleared Devil's Den. Uh, Ward's Brigade has been active. They can be activated constantly now. Um, all, actually, all of Bernie's, I think, can now, and Humphreys will. He'll, be, he'll come live on this turn. Humphreys will, so... Yeah, this is this is going to get real interesting, especially right here in this pocket right here, because if they can, Ward is not a weak unit, he's not a weak brigade, but if the the hoods hoods division can shatter that, then they'll only have these two brigades they got to deal with on round top. And I guess this next turn is going to be a question of who gets first activations, because if the Confederates should get one or two for Hood, they might be able to push their way up to round top. We got some cannons up there on little round top now for the Union. That'll be able this turn to fire straight down into these Confederates. Um, artillery in this game, as opposed to others, uh, canister range, your 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 cannons are going to get uh, one hundred fifty percent. So if you've got a if you've got a six firing in canister range, it's going to end up being uh, uh, nine points firing. So that's the plus. Whereas other games, you might get times two, times four, times eight on the tactical level games to. Uh, really spruce up the damage that the uh, artillery can do.
Um, the Union artillery has been much more effective. The Confederate artillery in this game, of course, the Confederates, you probably need to keep a lot of these four-gun units stacked together so they can fire together. Uh, the sixes, the most, almost all the Union batteries are sixes. So, and two of them have been flipped right now, and one's been eliminated. So they, their single, single counter batteries, uh, being sixes, they can stay separated and still do decent firepower. Whereas you need to put the Confederates together with the fours to get eight out of those, uh, as far as strength markers go. All right, but this is Longstreet's attack. We're two turns in. We're definitely going to keep playing this one because I like this. I do like this so far. Now look. This is different. Of all the Civil War Hex Encounter games uh, at battle level that I've played, they all have some similarities. At, at a, and this is a tactical level game. They all have some similarities. This is a whole different animal. It's a whole different breed. If you really want to play a Civil War game that just has a completely different set of rules, get you one of these. There's four or five of these out there. And not a lot of informational stuff that you have to account for like you do in most games. So that makes that part of it easier. Uh, the tables are definitely different. The combat tables and the cohesion tables are definitely... First off, you don't see cohesion tables in many games. But the combat results and flipping over to the cohesion table, depending on a color of cohesion and a dice roll, is a very interesting, interesting concept. And so far, I'm enjoying this. And this, it, you have to think. You really have to think with this one here. Uh, and I'm going to state this again, and I commented it when I was playing Stonewall Sword, that the unit support rule is very, very important. It might be just a minus one uh, in your cohesion, but amazing enough, that minus one can mean an awful lot in your cohesion. So make sure you all pay attention to the unit support rule. All right, so that's Long Street Attack. That's uh, through the first two turns on July 2nd uh, with Hood's Attack underway. And McClaws is fixing to get underway here in another turn or two. And uh, let's get this thing posted. Give me your all's thoughts on this game here. If you've played it, let me know what you think. I have to assume, I know that uh, P. Ridge, the Ozark one, is a two-mapper that's bigger. And it's I believe it's the full battle. I've got it over. I haven't played that one yet. But... Right now, this one looks like the most involved of the, the two that I've played. Well, definitely, this is the most involved of the two that I've played. All right, tell me what you think about this thing. Tell me if you like it, you don't like it. Give me some suggestions about uh, maybe the tactics in here, um, what I should be going after, or how I should respond as the Union All right, with limited activation. All right, it's Hexy. We'll talk to you all soon.